thank you very, very much for inviting me. And I hope we manage even with the sort of technological problems. Um, I'm starting just moving on to slide two, which is um, which just where I'm basically this is the context. Food's a problem. We agree. It's that slide um, system poses a huge number of environmental human health, economic development, and other problems. And we hear pages and pages and pages written about it, uh, conferences organized, policy papers written, and so on and so forth. And we all agree that it's a problem. Um, and, and many of you will obviously be working on various dimensions of the problem, researching what the causes are, researching what the solutions might be, how we measure them, and so forth. But what problem do we actually see? Now, this is just one of those quite um, deep visual tricks where um, what I see is a, a young girl with her head turned away from me, but others in the audience may see an old woman, and uh, which I can now see as well, but it took me ages to see it. I'm just, what I'm trying to say is that what we see as the problem very much depends upon our uh, perspective. And that's really going to be the substance of my talk, how we have different perspectives on what really lies at the heart of the food problem. Um, um, the first thing to say is that there are any number of stakeholders who all have a view, who all have a stake in the debate around food. And at, at its most basic Stakeholders are the 7 billion people who are on this planet, all of whom will need to eat. Um, but how we see ourselves with the stake in it depends on whether we view ourselves as consumers, parents, whether we see ourselves as citizens who are trying to take part in a democratic process of moving something into a different direction. We may label ourselves as meat eaters, as vegetarians, as vegans, and so forth. And then, of course, apart from the 7 billion people, we have um, people who have perhaps a more concrete stake in the food system, either for economic reasons or for ideological reasons. So we have the farming and the agri-food industry. We have the NGO civil society sector who may be promoting a particular issue or a particular approach. And then, of course, you have people, again, sort of consumers with specific dietary interests, whether it's religious, whether it's ethical. And then we have other people who are engaged one way or another uh, in the inter it concerns perhaps international development, ethics. And then you've got the, the big international research institutes and the UN organizations. And then sitting apparently to the side of all this, policymakers who are supposed to make policies on the basis of good evidence and the academics who are supposed to supply the good evidence. And of course, it would be lovely if we were all as impartial and as disinterested as that sounds. But of course, we all bring our own values and perspectives to the to the day to day task of doing research or making policy. So there's a very porous interface uh, among these groups. Put the very, very simply, I think there are three ways in which we can articulate uh, how people frame the problem and how that shapes what a solution might look like. And the first, the first framing of the problem is there's not enough food. And not only is there not enough food, but food that we're producing is very unsustainable. So that, 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 that leads to an automatic answer, which is, well, we need to produce more food then, and we need to do so more efficiently. But there's another framing of the problem, which says, actually, it's not about the production side. It's the fact that we're all too greedy. We're all too eating, eating too much and of the wrong kinds of foods. And therefore, the answer lies in measures to address the driver of production, which is, of course, consumption. And then a third perspective has it that it's not about production. It's not about consumption. It's about the relationship among the actors in the food system. And 
insufficiency in others, over pollution in some parts and and land degradation in others. And what we need to do, and this is almost a, a this is a sort of an economic, socio-economic argument. We need to transform the system. Now, but this is ostensibly about the environment and sustainability. But of course, all the, these perspectives are informed by and also shape different views on, well, firstly, how we produce this food and how much of it, but also how we think about ideas like food security, how we, what, what aspects of food security we privilege, how we think about our nutritional challenges, how we define and value animal ethics and animal welfare, how, how we uh, interact and think about on quite a personal relationship with the environment about consumption and growth and freedom and of course the metrics we use to assess progress okay i'm moving to slide seven now which says which is labeled perspective one so so the, this this perspective i'm just going to go through them and say that the, this perspective which is about not enough food the argument is we need to produce more food with less environmental impact. It's very simple. It's a technical challenge. And what we need to do, how we do it, is we change how food is produced and how agriculture is practiced. And, and often the people who advance this particular view tend to be farmers. Not not all farmers, but the kind of the mainstream ones. And the mainstream food industry. And I would add to that... Um, and the sorts of approaches that they, they advocate are things like um, sustainable intensification. And I know that's a concept that it may have its own Swedish phrase, but it has a great deal of currency here in the UK, which is doing more with less impact. So through more precisely calibrated uh, nitrogen use efficiency, um, uh, those, those sorts of techniques. Um, and and the, the, of paramount importance is the need to avoid land use change and biodiversity loss, and that is to be achieved through a land sparing approach. So you in, increase your yield in order to spare land from further agricultural encroachment. And and there are plenty of studies. A very influential one by I think Jess Burney. Uh, um, and, and others which was which showed that the green revolution has had this massive land sparing effect by uh, leading to this greater greater yields without uh, excessive land brought into production so that's really central to this concept of sustainable intensification other approaches are to store carbon in soils and uh, in plant matter as a form of sequestration um, and, and, and a, a removal of, of atmospheric CO2. Uh, obviously, breeding plants and livestock by yielding, that goes hand in hand with the nutrient use efficiency and so forth. Trying to develop closed loop systems, so managing the manure, uh, so you get energy out of it. Um, and so forth. And, and of course, along further along the supply chain, it's all about cleaner, greener transport. Um, but it's not just about these agricultural techniques, because this efficiency produced more perspective um, also has different takes on these other issues, the, these other understandings of the challenges. So Food security. Food security is a multi-dimensional concept about availability, about access, about utilisation, and about stability. But their focus is very much on the 800 million people worldwide who don't get enough to eat, and and it is still seen as a supply side problem. And so the so that emphasis on too many hungry people, less emphasis on the problems of overweight and obesity. Although with Nutrition. This emphasis is on uh, reformulations, lower the fat content, lower the sugar content, enhance the nutrient content. Um, measures such as biofortification or fortification and supplementation. Obviously, there's a take on animal welfare, and of course, animal welfare. And I know I'm speaking to animal ethicists in the room, but it comes with those various uh, understandings of how we define it. 
uh, in terms of physiological good health, um, freedom to express natural behaviour, and the whole natural living aspect of good welfare. But this perspective very much uh, places emphasis on the, on the good physiological health to be achieved through good management. And, and again, this idea is about nature, it's about the wilderness in order to have this land sparing effect. So at its most uh, kind of science fiction extreme, it would be and save for nature. Um, it's ideas that everyone agrees that we ought to be addressing waste, but they place a strong emphasis on this idea that it leads to win-wins. You, you cut out waste in the supply chain and you're going to get economic gains. And the emphasis of freedom is about visual choice, the freedom to choose smarter, cleaner, greener product. And again, it has a very optimistic idea about growth, economic growth, that if we consume more smartly, we can decouple um, economic growth from environmental impact. And the metrics used to assess, and, and just that other blob, which is very optimistic about the scope for agri-tech innovation in helping solve our problems. And, and the, the, the kind of the metrics used to assess this in LCA has been, of course, hugely influential. Um, but the aspect of LCA that perhaps is placed most emphasis on is this idea of, so it's a relative, it's all about relative improvements. And of course, the emphasis also on the uh, carbon saving benefits of sparing land and therefore avoiding uh, land use change incurred uh, CO2 emissions. So the second perspective, which is about <coughs> restraining demand. So again, this perspective has it that production side problems, so they're not going to solve it, the problem, or if they do solve the problem, they're not going to solve the health challenges we face and the many other um, problems that are inherent in the food system. And and so what we need to do is shift our consumption patterns. We change drivers of production. And this is very... Uh, an approach that is held very strongly, uh, particularly in sort of Western Europe, about among environmental NGOs, animal welfare, groups and to a certain extent public health campaigners, meat and dairy products, as well as to reduce food losses and waste. Although, as I say, that's a, 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 an idea that's common to all perspectives. And it, um, so, so, again, it's not just about the environmental approach, but it's, it has a different framing of the food security challenge. It may say, yeah, 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 there are 800 million people who are hungry Still, but the real problem into the future is the two billion people who are overweight or obese, who are eating too much. And there is there is the overconsumption of resources and there's the physical overconsumption of calories and food. So they they emphasize that and they see that there being a win win between measures to reduce consumption of resource intensive foods, meat and dairy products and health benefits and environmental benefits. Uh, their take on animal ethics is that the fewer the numbers of animals, obviously the better that is for, for animals, fewer animals born to suffer, and or you can also um, de-intensify systems of production. Um, and again, so they're, they're not, they're a semi-land sparing approach in that they see there being this huge um, opportunity gain of um, taking land out of livestock production and a enabling it to be put over to nature or to soil carbon separation or bioenergy production or whatever. At the same time, they may also advocate a return to uh, high yielding systems that are perhaps more wildlife friendly. The sort of so there's a, a composite approach of the land sparing or sharing depending on particular particular individuals. Um, again, their framing of waste, you know, is that what feeding grains to animals is a waste of resources. And so that's their view on the whole waste issue. And when it comes to ideas about freedom, they see 
they see the kind of 60 different brands of breakfast cereal on, in the supermarket as as limiting freedom, as locking us into the sort of the trammels of a consumerist society. So this is almost quite a religious approach in a way, but it's about freedom from choice, freedom from the pressures of consumption, that we can live better by consuming less. And they very much take an approach limits growth rather than this idea that we can have this green growth that decouples production from impact. And and the agri-tech and the technological innovation are very ambivalent. So yes, there's a role for it, but that also ag- innovation can lock us into our consumption patterns that will shore up problems for us further down the line. And they use LCA and the, the insights from LCA, again, to advance their particular perspective, but emphasizing less the, the relative intensity of different products as a per, and, the, and the savings that can be achieved and more uh, the absolute impacts of certain uh, consumption patterns and uh, comparing a kind of meat intensive and a plant based diet, on, you know, in that in that way. So the third perspective, this is the, and that it's it's not about one thing or the other, but it's about the governance, the political and the social institutions that uh, that govern the food system, that that lead to some actors being more, and interest groups being more powerful than others, and <clears throat> the stakeholders who are involved in this are actually the broadest spectrum of all, I think, because they encompass the very dark green alternative food movement, but also people who work in international development. And and I never know whether this is three or four perspectives, but I always end up lumping them together because I think they share this socioeconomic uh, dance on the issues. And, and their approaches is about more fair and more equal terms of trade between between low-income and high-income countries or between smaller producers and larger producers. It's about limiting wastes and losses for the benefit of poor people. It's about empowering small farmers um, and encouraging more local food provisioning systems. And they may often advocate organic farming and agroecological practices for lots of different reasons. Um, So that... Their focus, um, when it comes to food security, I think this is the one that is strongest on the fact that food security is not just about a supply or even the details of what you eat. It's about the framing conditions. What can you afford? What's the local market? Where is it? Can you access it? Do you have stability in access to food over time? What's the relationship between your ability income that will enable you to afford food as well so it's about the means of production as well as the means of consumption um their view on animal ethics well again this can vary but there's a very much a a sort of one health approach that you dress um animals and humans in development together you're getting better health for animals better productivity good for human livelihoods and it's a virtuous cycle going i think they very much take a very explicitly land sharing approach. And that's that's that we can somehow live in a harmonious relationship as as it has been seen that we can do in the past. So you could argue that in some ways it's quite a romanticized notion of integrating humans into the landscape. Um, and and the idea of uh, reducing waste is for, for food security. What's in it for humans, uh, rather than for cost saving or to for kind of the, the whole animal uh, feeding grains to livestock issue? So again, freedom to self determine. It's not about consuming more or less. It's about having your own choices, um, and it's about equitable growth and fairness. And and I think their view on agri tech, whether it's GM technology, whatever it is, is that. It's not so much that the technology that's the problem, it's the who controls it and who invests in it and for whom. 
So it's again, it's a socioeconomic framing. Um, when it comes to sort of the metrics used to assess progress, well, I think I think here the metrics are from an environmental point of view are least developed. Um, and I think there's a critique that sometimes LCA can be very reductive because it measures one thing or two things or three things. It doesn't quite capture the socioeconomic dimension, the multiplicity of outputs in the system or the need for people in low income countries to adopt more resilient lifestyles, which means that, that um, you're trying to juggle lots of different balls at the same time. They may Hey. Hello? Yes. yes. Yeah, sorry, I can hear other people. Um, um, and then, then I think what's quite interesting is that there are subcurrent within this perspective that sees the problem of, of livestock as the fossil fuel based CO2 emissions is more problematic than the methane from livestock. And that would lead you, that's based on the idea that intensive systems of production that are absolutely uh, uh, energy, fossil fuel energy is absolutely industrialized systems without them, that that's the root of the problem, not the so-called natural gases of methane. And I'll come on to that a bit later. So this next slide, the one that's labeled stakeholders don't fit neatly into one approach, um, it just goes to show that that you know, obviously, that's a very or well, they're all very simplistic, these framings and different uh, stakeholders have different, um, you know, they span different perspectives. Or you can have uh, people who may advocate veganism for very different reasons that uh, livestock are inefficient. That's the left. Um, as opposed to, you know, because there's something to do with human greed, top right. Um, and so so pe people don't fit neatly into one approach and we all have our biases so this just kind of that's this is and have changed over time perhaps i've got a bit older i've got a little bit more um more moderate and uh, and and people change according to you know whether it's a tuesday afternoon or a saturday night you know we we are inconsistent as human beings and i that's probably a, a good thing Next slide, please. So what I want to sort of focus on now is how these different perspectives play themselves out in narratives about the future of livestock, which is, I know, in Sweden, as it is in the UK, a very contested uh, issue. All these discussions about meat are happening and you will you will have had them. So on the one hand, beef is, you know, it's the devil. It has such a high carbon footprint producing all these greenhouse gases say actually no grass-fed beef is going to save the planet but it's going to sequester all this carbon and then you get people who say you know uh actually no 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 it's all about the pigs and poultry because they eat all these grains that that um you know could be fed directly to humans and then you get the cg IAR, the International Research Institute, say we need to increase poor people's access to meat and milk and fish because it's essential to their food security. And then, of course, you get the vegans saying, oh, no, it's actually rich world meat consumption that is starving poor people. So all those contestations, and that's just for the environment. And then you've got the health issue, which is... Um, so on the one hand, you have people are uh, meat is a major contributor to the causes of obesity. And then you get the people on the other side saying, yes, but meat is very high in protein. It seals you up. It offers satiety. It can help in weight loss. And then you get people saying, oh, no, meat's really high in saturated fat. And on the other side, you get the meat industry or you get the paleo movement saying, well, you can trim the fat off. And modern breeds are uh, actually have been bred for much, much lower fat content anyway these days. Or, you know, actually, it's a whole myth. Sugar's the problem. It's not fat after all. And then you have the undoubted evidence that meat eaters have higher uh, body mass index than vegetarians. And then people say, well, that's that's associational. It's not causational. And anyway, vegetarians are notably health conscious. And so you can't, um, the whole lifestyle. 
fat link. And then you get people saying, well, you know, we eat too much protein. We don't need all this meat. And other people saying, well, it's actually not about the protein. Meat is, meat products have an excellent bioavailable source of iron and zinc and all the rest of it. And then you get people saying, well, look, the WHO has said meat gives you cancer. And then, then turning around saying, well, the only the, the association is only very clear with the processed meat. And anyway, what's the dose response relationship? It doesn't mean that one one sausage is going to kill you. So, again, with that, it's very, very complex. Um, I think that leads to um, all sorts of different views on where we want to go with meat. And 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 I think those views are sort of not just what future do we want, but how people analyze the future we already have and also how people think about, irrespective of what they want or not, what they think we're going to get unless we're careful. Uh, some, some scenarios that are really, really simplistic that show different visions of possible livestock futures um, based on these different framings of, of, of what we can do and what might be desirable. So, so what, one is the kind of, you know, the, on the bottom right, the, the, your intensive ch chickens, are they the ultimate inefficiency or are they a waste of grains? Bottom left, are these sheep grazing on a hillside a nasty bag of methane or the miracle of producing grass from, you know, food from absolutely nothing, from scrubby grass? Uh, top right is in vitro meat. Is it the answer to all our solutions to this uh, ongoing alienation from the natural world and the pretense that we're not part of the, the environment? And, and then, you know, you're, you've got your plant-based diet. Is this the nutritional goal or is it, is it actually going to contribute to micronutrient disease and, and is it highly unrealistic? Next slide, please. So let's sort of go through these scenarios and talk about how these, uh, what the rationale for them are is and, and, and what the benefits might be for these futures, uh, as well as some of the risks to manage. So the rationale for this this idea of the future of being white, the future being chicken, is that, well, demand for meat's growing. We can't do anything about this demand. People really like chicken, so it's a positive di development. Uh, beef, for all sorts of reasons, towards these um, white meats. Um, that we really can't tell people what to eat, either because they won't listen or because you know, there are real ideological problems with this. People should be free to eat what they like. And anyway, there's no political will. And and meat is good for the economy. There's loads of jobs in livestock farming, in the uh, processing industry. Um, and so, OK, meat is problematic. It's got a high carbon footprint. But we need to produce this more food, so we need to do it with less impact. And we can do this because technology keeps improving. And if we are going to be eating meat, then the way forward is with poultry because it's got really high feed conversion efficiencies and it can deliver maximum production at least greenhouse gas cost. And there are benefits. So the benefits that are seen are, you know, a shift towards this poultry as delivers relative improvements in greenhouse gas emissions, water use efficiency, and nutrient use efficiency, and we get these more protein and micronutrients in a relatively low fat form. And if we have these big intensive systems, um, they lend themselves better to uh, good management, uh, latest technology, um, IT, traceability, and we can, we, can, we can ensure safe systems this way. All those nutrients, all that manure coming out from the chickens, all the feathers and so forth, well, we can we can turn them into bioenergy, and um, and yes, lives these chickens they do eat soy and other grains, and that is a problem. But we can look at novel feed sources, insects, for example, um, <coughs> and and we can also close the loop further because if you process chicken uh, in the factory, and that can be turned around and used to produce another product. Um, 
And, and the benefit of this approach is that land is spared for nature and bioenergy or whatever you might want to do with it, and people get to eat what they want. And, of course, that, that what they want is better than beef, which has this high carbon footprint. So, um, yeah, but, of course, there are problems, and, you know, advocates of this view may acknowledge these problems. Yes, animal welfare, that may be a problem. So what do you do about it? Well, you could turn around and say... We've got poor people in low-income countries. Don't turn around and tell me that. One's life is more important than that of a starving child. Or you could say, well, you know, good and bad welfare. In very good health. You can uh, have excellent veterinary care, um, and you can and you can manage welfare that way. Or you could develop breeding that breeds animals, you know, to be more docile in conditions. Um, there may be problems with can we achieve absolute greenhouse gas uh, reductions or, or if not, or perhaps absolute, but uh, bearing in mind all, you know, the scale of the mitigation challenge we face. Well, you can sequester carbon on the spared land. Uh, perhaps you can play around with geoengineering. And, of course, you can never underestimate technology, which often we have a phrase in English that pulls the rabbit out of the hat, you know, that comes to one's aid just at the very last minute when you thought you were stuffed. Um, what about the rural economy? These very intensive systems may uh, reduce the number of jobs available, but People are moving to cities anyway, so you increase jobs in urban areas and you take the value chain approach post-harvest and the post-slaughter post rather uh, along the whole of the supply chain. Yes, there are problems with zoonotic diseases and food safety. Again, that's where technology and good management comes in. And, uh, well, if people keep eating the way people want to be eating, there is that problem of obesity, but chicken is low fat. You can develop. Uh, low-fat, tasty products, you can reformulate, you can uh, develop drugs that cure obesity, you can encourage people to go to the gym, and you can do all the information and awareness raising. So you can tackle the problem that way. And there's another perspective, which is sort of in vitro meat. And again, this is, you know, at present pretty science-y fiction-y, but it's a, it's a current of thought that's there. And and the idea behind this is the same as the as the poultry one. The demand for meat is growing and we can't do anything about it. And people like meat. But, you know, human ingenuity, it can tackle the problem. And there are welfare concerns with intensive production. So why the animal and go straight to the lab? And and do it that way, and and that there is interest, and even people like Bill Gates are interested, and and that this is this is a, a viable a viable uh, possibility that if we invested sufficient resources in, could become a reality. The benefits are obvious. You get uh, lots of food with very low uh, environmental impact. The food production is flexible. You can produce anything from cheap chicken nuggets to sirloin steak. They can be designed to optimize health. You can scale it up. No animals are harmed in the process. You can make it kosher, halal, and anyway, it's vegetarian. And you spare this land. And, well, jobs. Um, maybe you can create new jobs in, in, in this new uh, science, science uh, food industry. There will be risk to manage, and I think one of the big ones is uh, consumer acceptability, obviously, concerns that it's not natural, you know, and I suppose the lesson you can learn from that is avoid the GM fiasco, where it was about, you know, communication, so it's about communicating well, it's about highlighting the fact that what on earth do we mean by natural, is a, is a modern dairy cow unnatural, uh, natural? natural is natural good uh, maybe maybe new foods are we have a, a celebrity chef in the uk called uh, heston blumenthal who likes doing all these scientific experiments with food maybe it'll be cool um so it's about how you present and market and frame it and as for jobs well 
you can create jobs in conservation from all that land spared or in cities. So there are solutions. So then we get to the one about, um, you know, so the, the one or the, the rationale for this one is that, OK, people do like meat. So it starts with that acceptance. But also that why do we uh, why do we see livestock as a problem that in the right context, in the right systems and at the right scale, they can be part of the solution. We've always farmed. It's really core to our, our cultures and our identities and our landscapes. And we should. Use what animals are good at. Should we should harness this ability, um, and and that way they can be part of the solution. And what's more, it's argued from this perspective that by well managed grazing can actually help sequester carbon. So you're actively mitigating greenhouse gas emissions. They would disagree with the view that meat is unhealthy, that meat is healthy, and that this grass fed meat has a higher, better nutrition than the than the grain fed meat. And that people, the assumption is that people pay for better and they will moderate their consumption, that less and better is actually possible. The benefit, well, top of that is the list is, is resource efficient. of carbon, that there is mitigation benefits and that there is this, this kind of miracle of their metabolism. And that, that what's more is that by... By rearing animals on these uh, uplands and on these coarse byproducts, you're actually sparing arable land because you're producing an, an amount of food uh, using free rainfall, free land, that if you weren't producing it, you'd have to actually produce it on, on these arable crops. And, and the benefits are that these are, uh, you know, free range animals that enjoy a natural life that this fosters existing traditions and livelihoods. And it's all about reconnecting us with the natural world. So again, it's this land and sharing perspective. Risks. Well, first, how do we define a genuine byproduct? How do we define land unsuited for other purposes? You know, there's almost always a counterfactual use. So who gets to judge? That's one. The second is that this this perspective will will require really good uh, governance of land use or else you get further encroachment onto onto land um in order to graze livestock particularly if prices are very high and so that leads to another one meat will be more expensive and so then who gets to afford it and how do we deal with the equity side of things um Climate, how climate change may affect grasslands, might also affect the feasibility of the scenario. And then, of course, you get high methane emissions. So again, the framing of this is, well, you know, back in the olden days, wild herbivores used to, used to roam the grasslands producing methane. So this is nothing new. That's the baseline. Or the idea that methane is natural, it disperses and, you know, it breaks down after a few years. And this is a non-fossil fuel dependent for, um, scenario. So, so you're dealing with that problem. Animal welfare, well, you get, you may, depending on the nutritional adequacy of what the grass is they're eating, you may get problems there. But at least they are getting a natural life. Um, and what interventions are going to be needed to actually assure this kind of equi equity of access to these foods and what other foods need to be produced. So that's those are some of the risks to manage. So the fourth scenario is, is what I call fruits of the earth. And um, so the rationale for this is technology won't save us. And, and I would add to that, not only will it not save us, but it may lock us in to the un ongoing unsustainable um, assumptions and patterns and norms um, that, that feeding grains to animals undermines food security. So the, the kind of the, the poultry scenario is, is, is wrong on that count. But also, I think core to this is the idea that our demand is constantly changing. Our, our, what we choose to eat, our tastes and our preferences, they're not set in stone. They're not fixed. We can change them. 
And as if we can change them, then we need to actually look at how this might happen, that, that, that it's a kind of very positive about how we can shift our consumption patterns. That eating less meat is good for us as well. So it's win, win, wins all around. If we eat less meat, we save the environment and we do our health a favor. So the benefits are um, reduction in agricultural area, land spared for doing what you might want with it, return to nature, whatever, um, create new jobs in horticulture, um, fewer animals and more space for those who are still about. So good for welfare. Uh, you can do other things with crop residues. You don't have to pass them through an animal. Um, you don't get the manure surplus problems and the, all the water pollution that arises from that. You spare grains for humans and the assumption is everyone is healthier. But of course, there are risks as well. For a start, if we don't eat meat, what will we eat instead? And what are the environmental impacts of those foods, the water impacts and so forth? Livestock have contributed manure in the past. Um, does this mean that we will be uh, make it a bit harder to manage our systems organically? Not impossible, but maybe harder. Uh, meat um, <clears throat> may be a source of nutrients. Where will we get those from? Particularly for people who aren't going to spend hours planning their diets so that they're very, very uh, nutritionally balanced. Landscapes will look very different. Do we want that? Do we not want that? Um, the little question of consumer acceptability, can we get consumers to accept this? And that all depends on the success of our um, behavior change strategies. What about the fact that livestock have been central to our traditions and our cultures? You could argue that traditions and cultures are always changing. So we will have to manage that transition. And the same goes for jobs and livelihoods. But then there's also the question, why are we focusing on meat? Uh, sugar, coffee, tea, cut chocolate, these are all unnecessary foods. They use vast areas of land, lots of irrigation water in some, in some circumstances. Uh, why are we focusing on meat when we should we could be focusing on anything? We could be focusing on uh, putting our toast in the toaster to make toast instead of eating our bread raw. So where do you draw the line? So... I'm sort of coming to the end now. I've probably talked for too long. But, um, I mean, I suppose the observations are these are obviously very simplistic scenarios. Um, and the future, I, well, I have no idea what the future is going to be like, but I'm pretty sure it's going to be not one thing or another thing, but a whole mixture. Um, they, and they all can be modelled, these scenarios, and indeed they are being. And, and I think Ellen might be in the audience somewhere, but she's she's actually doing that and she's – they're kind of uh, nearly finished. So, you know, you can quantify the greenhouse gas emissions with a million assumptions, particularly with the artificial meat scenario. Um, you can quantify them. And, of course, there are also important research uncertainties to clear up about, for example, the royal role of carbon. We, you know, the, uh, the evidence there is going in all sorts of different directions. And perhaps more understanding of the role of meat and dairy and our health. Next slide, please. The one entitled, but whether these scenarios work. Um, <coughs> I think what's interesting to me is that our understanding of what constitutes a good scenario depends on a whole load of underpinning assumptions about what and what else is or is not in place. So, I don't know, with the with the uh, plant-based future, the, 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 the vegetarian, the vegan scenario, you have to make a whole load of assumption about the kinds of food production that we'll be investing in. Um, you know, will we put down more land for horticulture? The sorts of infrastructure that is available um, are our assumptions about technological artificial meat or uh, the extent to which uh, you can do interesting things with crop residues and produce useful our assumptions about feed conversion efficiency gains in poultry, our assumptions about what regulations might be politically acceptable, about what economic instruments will, will not only be acceptable, but, but whether they'll work or not. And of course, all our assumptions about how far we can change cultural norms and values and so forth. And I think the other reason why we 
have different visions of what success looks like in the future is what what you're assuming the counterfactual might be what reality might be instead so you could argue some but some person might argue for um uh, that that you know some person might hate the intensive chicken future because they see as the desirable alternative a, a certain scenario where we all eat healthy vegetarian diets but another person may be advocating an intensive chicken future not because they like it particularly, but because they see the alternative as one where everyone at red meat as being even worse. So the counterfactual is important. Again, assumptions about, you know, what would we eat if we didn't eat meat? There was a piece of work by Friends of the Earth that said that if we cut back on meat, we would have uh, 45,000 lives saved in the UK. Now, if you look at, at the, the research that they were basing that on, it wasn't the health savings from eating meat. It was the health benefits of, of not eating meat. It was the health benefits of eating more fruits and vegetables, which they assume people would eat instead of the meat. Now, that's a bit of an assumption. You could also argue that if people didn't eat meat, they might eat more sugary processed foods instead, or they might eat fruits and vegetables that have a very high impact. So, again, your assumptions really shape your idea of what constitutes a desirable or a possible or a least bad alternative. And I think all these are founded on beliefs about how far uh, the global economy is a, an act of God or, you know, a physical law, or if it's something that is malleable, that is a human construct that we can change. Um, your judgments about the legitimacy of government interventions, um, what we think about how much we need versus how much we want and how we define meat. Is it a need? Is it a want? How do we define these things? The extent to which we can change our demands, the extent to which smallholders and scale, you know, what, what values we attach to that, what values we attach to the landscapes, whether we think... Um, technology is morally neutral or morally loaded, our views on animal welfare and whether we think it's important or, in other words, how the world works, what's inevitable, what we can change, what should be changed and what good looks like. And I think all these different perspectives, uh, they drive lots of different kinds of advocacy, but they also cause a whole amount of miscommunication, which leads to inertia conclusions are that you know we need to do the numbers we need more research we need to we need to uh, look at different scenarios we need to look at different policy approaches and the implications of those approaches but i think we need to look at what's underneath we need to look at the values that everyone as individuals has about which numbers are used when advancing a drawing a conclusion when advancing an argument which ones are excluded of their use so the kind of the hidden narrative that threads the discussions and the arguments together and i've got some questions that you know i would love to have some answers to these but i don't um so one is you know how i mean the main question is how how can we find ways of people free if i see your point of view and if you see my point of view it doesn't necessarily mean that we can have solution it may mean that we have a, a better way of talking to one another but it doesn't necessarily mean that we can find a solution so i i don't know the answer to that i think there is there is miscommunication that comes simply because of the non availability of, of research or the use of bad research but i think some facts as we like as many accurate facts as we like and we will still disagree so those are some of the questions that that i'm i'm asking you and then my 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 penultimate slide the about the food climate research network it's it's based in the uk but it's a global network of of people who work on various aspects of food systems and sustainability um it's about communicating and disseminating the research of others um, it does its own sort of quite synthetic integrative work and it's about trying to build up a network 
of um, researchers and a activists and uh, businesses and policymakers um, who are engaged one way or another in these issues as a way of sharing uh, information um, and, and spreading ideas. So um, I will conclude by saying do please join uh, and it's free and it's available. You know, it's on this website. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Sarah.